Dr. John Vender, he's the vice chair of MCG's Department of Neurosurgery. Kind enough to take time out from his busy schedule to be here. Dr. Vender, thanks to you. Thanks for asking us. Absolutely. And Dr. Krishnan Dondapani, Dr. Dondapani is a neuroscientist at MCG as well. Uh, thanks for your research and for your time too, Chris. Thank you. My first question is uh, about your research on TBI and how when we're looking at ways to heal it, uh, you turn to things that make a lot of folks think of Gatorade and M&Ms, especially the blue kind. Dr. Vendor, I'll start with you. Tell me how a chemical or an ingredient in those things, or at least a relative of those ingredients, has helped you all recently in your research. Well, I think the, there's many chemical changes that occur in the brain with brain injury and many processes that are set into motion that occur over the first hours and days after the brain injury that we're trying to ameliorate with agents that we can give to the patient, you know. Uh, and basically, we're finding some interesting uh, drugs that do alter inflammation and brain swelling, edema, which are normal processes but can get out of control. And, and when they get out of control, can actually add additional injury to the brain. Mm -hmm very frustrating for a clinician because we have that patient in the hospital in the intensive care unit when these processes are occurring. And um, this is one of the exciting areas that Chris can expand upon that really gives us some hope to maybe blunt or break some of these cycles that are put into motion by the injury. All right, so you talked about all the chemical activity that's going on after a brain injury. Chris, how in the world, you know, I referenced the dye that's in those blue things, the brilliant blue G dye. What made you think, hey, this might be a good way to treat TBI? So that's a great question. It was, it was a bit of serendipity, I would say. So we were looking for compounds that would block a water channel in the brain called aquaporin-4. And it's been, there's been studies showing that aquaporin-4 actually leads to edema, which is the swelling in the brain or water in the brain, which is what Dr. Vendor treats clinically. So when a patient comes in, for example, after a severe car accident, they may see swelling in the brain. And so it's known that this water channel is involved in that process. And so we were looking for potential molecules that may go and block that water channel and stop the expression of that channel. And one of them that we found, searching some old literature, we went back 40 years where there was some sort of correlative data where, that suggests that consuming this dye actually may decrease swelling in some indications. So we went and we tried it in a preclinical traumatic brain injury model, and we found that indeed it worked. Uh, it brought the swelling down, it was improving outcomes, and particularly it was blocking one um, inflammatory factor called interleukin-1 beta. And interleukin-1 beta seems to be a biomarker. There's been clinical studies, actually Dr. Vendor's done some of these and, and elsewhere that have shown that patients ha that have elevated levels of interleukin-1 beta have a worse outcome, worse prognosis, more swelling. So we've been able to block that with this blue dye. And the blue dye, it's a cousin of FD&C blue dye number one, which you'll find in your blue M&Ms and any ice creams that have blue or purple colors. It's in blue and purple Gatorades at very low levels. When you looked at that old literature, was that being used to treat swelling in the brain or just other types of inflammation? No, it had never been looked at in the brain. And yeah. just sort of people were just looking what this dye would be doing. A lot of the research actually was in the early stages of getting FDA approval to put FD, FD and C blue dye number one into foods that we consume to find out is it safe, is it safe through dietary consumption. So nobody had really applied it into the indications that we were looking for. So whether it's with these water channels or with interleukin-1, are you blocking our immune response? Not really. I yeah. mean, this is more of a selective problem that we're trying to address with then, the brain then, edema. Okay, thanks. And then what do those water channels and interleukin-1 do when the body, when everything's normal with the body? What good are they? Well, they're part of the inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. What we're finding with moderate and severe brain injury is that what are normally good responses of the brain and of the body and of the immune system are taken to such an extreme that they become harmful. Mm -hmm. So trying to blunt or adjust or modify or modulate those processes so that not to completely shut them down per se but to make them less uh, impactful on the edema and therefore on the secondary what we call secondary brain injury which is the injury that occurs after the original event sounds like a bit of a balancing act yes exactly most things within our bodies work within ranges too low is bad too high is bad that's true of practically every chemical system in our body so the goal here is to try to rein in or control these processes that just become out of control. And uh, it's almost a 
downward spiral of additional swelling, additional inflammation, cause additional brain compression, loss of blood flow to the brain, additional injury to the cells, and then additional uh, swelling again. So we're trying to stop or at least blunt that cycle that's gone out of control basically. And how long do you have to try to stop it or blunt it before you can walk out of the room and let the patient be? Well, it's, it's an ongoing uh, process that occurs anywhere from the time of injury up to at least three to five days post-injury for the, what we call the acute or the immediate brain swelling. But the process is, in some of our studies we've looked at, we're seeing changes up several weeks after the brain injury. Mm -hmm. That the swelling continues that long after. S swelling, yeah, usually peaks between five, uh, three to five days, mm. and uh, changes go on well beyond that time point. So Doc, as a, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. As a clinician, you know, my biggest concern is getting that traumatically brain injured patient through that three to five day window with minimal injury to the brain, and uh, Dr. Dondapani's goal is to try to give me those tools to do that. I want to look into your toolbox a little bit deeper in just a moment, Chris, but let me ask you this. If you'll use one of the props that you were kind enough to bring and sort of show the viewers what happens after a brain injury when it comes to that swelling that you referenced, I guess the skull at some point just isn't big enough. Correct. And let me, if it's okay, clarify. When we're talking about brain injury, we're talking about a, a continuum of problems from mild brain injury, which would, would be concussion, and you mentioned CTE. That's a very important topic to cover also. Uh, moderate brain injury and then severe brain injury. And what we're discussing when we're talking about uncontrollable swelling and critically ill patients and high risk of, of dying or severe deficits, we're referring to the severe brain injury. We have a Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a measurement of the severity of injury. And we give a score anywhere from three to 15 based on eye opening, motor responses, and vocalizations. But you're still talking about someone who got hit in the head, right? right? Somebody yeah, brain injury is a dysfunction with or without brain damage mm -hmm. due to an externally applied force. So what happens inside and our bodies? What happens is, I, I always like this model because it kind of helps people visualize where the brain sits relative to our skull. And you see the ear and the, the eye and the nose kind of gives you an orientation. I don't know if the viewers um, can see, but is there always space in between the brain and uh, the there, skull itself? There's a small amount of space. With the brain. Room little wiggle room, which can work for you or against you. Again, uh, there's a layer of what we call cerebral spinal fluid between the middle lining of the brain, the co middle covering of the brain, and the brain surface called cerebral spinal fluid, and that is protective to a small degree. But with severe forces applied to the head or to the body, the brain will shift and move within the skull. And I have an example here. When you look at the base of the skull where the brain sits, you can actually hopefully see there's a lot of very rough corners and ridges that the brain can run up against. So not only does it impact upon the skull, but it can actually be injured against some of these surfaces. So when the brain starts to swell, the first job of the surgeon is to try to control those, that swelling medically. We have a device that we can place in the brain through a drill hole at the bedside in the critical care unit called a ventricular drain. The brain has fluid spaces in the center just like the heart does. Mm -hmm. um, the, our, our brain ventricles hold CSF, however, the cerebral spinal fluid. And we can drain that to help relieve pressure. And even a little bit of drainage can have a dramatic impact on the pressure in the brain. We also have the ability to monitor pressure in the brain through that catheter, that tube. We can also put a monitor just into the brain tissue itself and monitor pressure. And that helps guide therapy. Uh, in some cases, relatively uncommonly, surprisingly, there are surgical lesions like a big blood clot on the surface of the brain or underneath the lining of the brain or in the brain tissue itself like a bruise in the brain tissue. And so Dr. Dondapani, while Dr. Vendor is trying frantically to rein these processes in and address this swelling, what are you doing going back to this research, this federally funded research that you are doing over there? with your blue dye? Are you injecting the patient repeatedly while he tries to manage the things he outlined? Yeah, so we're preclinically looking at this, so it hasn't reached the point of a clinical trial yet. But Got what it. we're doing experimentally is we're trying to stop that process from ever happening. So very early on, for example, after, let's say you're in a car accident, the ambulance will bring you to the emergency room. Our goal is to actually administer some of the compounds that we're interested in, such as the Brilliant Blue G, very early on after the injury. For example, right when they reach the emergency room, that we hopefully will stop that swelling to happen two days, three days, four days, five days later. So we're trying to intervene to 
so it never needs to come to Dr. Vendor operating on you. How is it administered? Through a shot? It's through a shot. Into we, the brain? Uh, no, it's directly into the veins, so it's an intravenous injection mm -hmm. like you'd receive from many other drugs that are out there. Very simple. We've been able to give it experimentally up to several hours after the initial injury. So we could even wait four or five hours after the injury. We can get our, we can see our effect that it brings down the swelling in the brain, brings down intracranial pressure. What are y'all doing it on mice? We're using mice models, yes, yeah. experimentally. And how's it going so far? Excellent. We've gotten really promising results. And really one of the big things our lab's interested in is why we targeted the Brilliant Bougie. We, we think the immune system has a big role in what's happening in the brain after trauma. Mm -hmm. So classically over the last few decades, most neuroscientists treated TBI as a neuroscience problem. It's a brain problem. The problem starts in the brain, it ends in the brain. And what we're trying to look at at the Medical College of Georgia with our research is the possibility that the immune system actually has a role in this. And so what we're actually blocking with the Brilliant Bougie is some of these early immune responses, these inflammatory responses. I think most people know you take aspirin. It's a way to bring down inflammation and swelling. In, in some ways, we're trying to target that same pathway to bring that down, that initial swelling after an injury, because we think a lot of these immune cells that bring that inflammation, they're actually bringing it into the brain from the outside. And so we're trying to damp down a lot of that immune response early on after the injury. And that's the question I was trying to ask at the beginning, and I'm, sh I'm sure I asked it incorrectly. You are pushing back what the body's trying to do. Correct. And so I guess my question is, how long mm -hmm. do you push back? And I think you said until the swelling is manageable. And then um, why doesn't the body know to do it on its own? I mean, it's, it's almost as if we're fighting how we were made. Well, I think one of the answers I've heard that made a lot of sense is that we've evolved and we're exposed to things that we really were never exposed to before. I mean, motor vehicles and some of the sports and the level of, of impact and, and, and contact that we're, we, we experience has really changed over, over the decades and over the centuries. So it's possible that we're just not catching up. But um, I think the, the biggest concern, and, and Chris mentioned, is timing. There's a lot of medications, a lot of therapies that work great if they're administered prior to the injury. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have to find agents that work effectively and safely on the processes we're targeting without any effect on any other processes in the body, which may be critical to not disrupt, in other words, have a very specific therapy, but it has to be something that will have an effect delivered after injury. I want to take a break real quick, and then okay. I'm going to come back for a brief segment with you all, because I promised the viewers we'd talk about sports injuries yes. and CTE, so we'll do that just as soon as we come back. Doctors, thank you so much for being here. The time's getting Pleasure. away from us. It's yes. fascinating information. We'll be back.